day has come around. It's time for the bridge to explore a day at the races. The Three County Fair in North Hampton, Massachusetts is a 120 year old late summer event which combines the harvest season with a 10 day event to commemorate the season. An ode to a vanishing way of life. The Three County Fair combines the old charm of county fairs gone by with nine races a day for those who wish to chance their luck. Come with us as the bridge explores this piece of Americana. Victor, how long have you been working as a guard here? 14 years. 14 years. How do you like it? I love it. Um, I've seen been you at here this for a long time. 14 years. I've seen you here for a long yeah. time. Yeah. Seen any funny stories? Oh, you hear, you hear a lot of them. Okay. You'd like to tell me one or? Well, you know, I saw when the horse got loose, the guy wanted me to run after it. I said, "What are you crazy?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they have a lot here. You know, you can. In 14 years, you can you can see a lot of everything. You can see a lot of everything. What's your name? Okay, thanks. And you run this part of the exhibit, or is it everything? No, just just in the barn here. The fairgrounds owns most of, most of the antiques. The only thing I change is I bring in different tractors every single year. The farmers sort of like to like to show their worth here. So, uh, every year, I get probably in at least four or five different ones. So everybody comes in here, they're looking to see what's here next year. At one time, we had all antique tractors. And then I come to realize a lot of people that are younger than I am are asking what an antique is. So you can't really explain what an antique is until you put a new one right alongside it. So we've been putting a new one in and show how user friendly the new one is compared to the old one, which was one step better than the horse. Yeah, with the crank and yeah. everything else. Yeah. How many years have you been doing this? About seven years. But seven I years? grew up on a dairy farm and uh, around this area, or yeah, yeah. We so had you know a lot of the farmers around here, or oh, I know them because we interact together. And I, I've been here for 50 years, so I went to school with a lot of them. And then you kind of invite them to come down or they get in touch with you, so it's kind of like an informal word of well, mouth thing? Basically like it's an informal word of mouth now. Like everybody here, they called me. I didn't have to go looking for it, for anybody, but uh, we started doing this about seven years ago as far as putting the tractors in here because they used to just open it up before we, but before my sister and I did it, and all it was was a lot of antiques. So. Like, like people said, well, how do you know this is an antique until you until you put it against, you know, something that's new. Against the new stuff, yeah. right. Yeah. These exhibits are really popular. People really find that interesting. Yeah. Like Pe people who come from an agricultural background. We have a wooden hay rake We're right over there against the wall. I could never figure out how that worked. It's horse drawn down there with the, with the wooden spikes. Oh, the one right down there. Yeah, with the wooden spikes. Well, I could never figure out how that how that worked. And a gentleman come in here, all dressed up in a suit, a businessman. He says, "I grew up watching my grandfather use one of them." I'll be done. I said, "Gee, I said I can't figure out how it works." So he comes back the next day, and he comes back with a picture of his grandfather. Oh, and it was pulled along by the horse. On, yeah, on the side. and it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's pulled by the horse, and when you get enough hay, it's got a trip lever, and it tips forward. You bring it over the hay, back the horse up. And it recocks. I'll be it, done. It works. That it was a prelude to that. Yeah. Wow. That's something. So my sister's very creative. So she took the grandson's gator, which she drives around the farm. <laughs> and, uh, that's, that's terrific. <laughs> brought that over here. <laughs> you guys are talking about antiques. I've been covering this here for more than now I own horses. We do a little bit here. How old are you now? What? 69. I was going to say, you don't look 69. I was, <laughs> was going to say you're in your early 60s. 
Bruce. Last name is Dapson. How long have you been in this business for, Bruce? Since 1958. How'd you get into the game? My brother and I uh, thought we knew everything back then. We were right? young kids, and the minute we did it, we got bit by it. You uh, from around this area? You grew up here? Yeah, the Lee Lennox Stockbridge area. Yeah. And um, so you've been doing this 58 a lot. Any changes, or it seems like this track keeps temporarily going on the same way? Well, uh, fortunately this year there's plenty of horses here. There's over 300 plus ship ins, so this would be a good meet. But the other two fairs have gone by the wayside, so this is it. So have you always owned horses, or did you yeah. get in Ever from, since from 58? 58. Wow. Lost a lot of money and made a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> it's more than just doing it for the money, though, right? Oh, it's the it's the sport, you know. Yeah, you, you, you love it. The, the the fears here get a little tempting to shoot somebody once in a while. You know? Right. Because <laughs> everything's not always above board. Yeah, it's a, it's a great sport. I've raced all over the country. There aren't many tracks I haven't raced at. I just know I say your name. Uh, Jay Ferrar. And what are you doing here? Uh, doing the simulcasting for the fair for the racing. And what does that entail? Uh, we take their video signal that is produced by Post Time Productions and we put it up on the bird and they have about 20 outlets that take it down. We send them decoders and receivers, you know, just like for your... And it goes yeah. out all over the... Um... And it goes all... Well, it goes all over North America, really. Southern Canada and the f lower 48. Really? Uh, but they have a little fair like this. I think we have 20 outlets for them. Now, what do you get uh, hired by the different fairs or racetracks to do this, or uh, yes, yes. What are some other tracks you've done? Uh, I've worked uh, in the past for Keeneland, which is down in Kentucky. Sure, I know it is. Uh, Delta Downs in Louisiana. I currently do this fair, some main harness tracks, uh, some main fairs, plus Raynham Taut and Greyhound Park and Newport High Life. And you're up here for the whole meet. I'm here for the ten days. There's ten cards of racing. Great. What's your name? And your jockey here? Or? Yes, sir. How long have you been racing? Uh, 27 years. And what brings you to Northampton? Uh, I have a lot of fun here. It's a, it's a relaxed racing style. You can uh, you know, just enjoy it. It's fun. How do you find the racing conditions? Kind of fun being at a county fair? Yeah, it's, it's, they, they do a very good job. Yeah, What's you ran a second with Storm Arrange with me last year. Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. I did. Thank you very much. I, unfortunately, I was not here. I would have made a little, I know that. little contribution to you. Yes, sir. So you're going to be at the whole meet? Yes, sir. You've been leading rider here how many times? About four uh, or five? I, think, I don't think I've ever been leading rider here. I've always been right close to it. I thought you beat up Butler one year. That's possible. I really don't remember. I don't, I don't believe I ever got a trophy from out of here. Okay. Uh, well, let's change that this year then. That would be wonderful. I've always been in the stands. I've always done very well. I've always held my own. I have no complaints. What are you riding at right now? Weight wise? Yeah. I'll be tacking 118 this week. 118? Yes, very good. Well, you're lean and mean. Yeah, a race riding was, machine. I was heavy last week and I made a <laughs> promise that I wouldn't be that this week. Well, I'm sure you'll give Ivan Ortiz a run for his money. Well, I'm certainly going to try and give him all one. <laughs> Terrific. Take Wait, care. Maybe you can tell my viewers how you wound up getting your mounts. They want to contact you or do you? No, no. I just uh, I pretty much know a lot of these people from Boston and uh, they know me. And, uh, and they pretty much be, uh, they pretty much come up to me and ask me. And it's kind of word of mouth then. Yes, yeah. exactly. Word of mouth. And plus, they've seen me ride and they like the way I ride these type of tracks. You have to be a kind of a more of a rough, rough, rougher rider than you would on a mile track. Get on the pace. Yeah, well, you got to. Uh, there's a lot of bumping involved, and the uh, it's on a smaller track. Uh, speed is pretty much of the essence. Yes, you got to have speed, and you just got to save ground is the key. You got to uh -huh. save ground. You don't want to go wide on these turns. It's and negotiate those tight turns. It's very, well. it's difficult. You know, we might want to make the turn. The horse may have another, <laughs> might have other ideas. I've seen right, that, that tight turn over there. Keep going straight, huh? On them. <laughs> I saw Rodney Creedon go right over that wall one time. Yes, yes, yes. The horse just would not straighten out. He went right over, yep. right over the fence. Yeah, it's a horror show. <laughs> okay, thanks. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. I'm sure you'll be able to talk to him when he's done some stuff. And I, this is, you'd like to get some idea on the pad of the parent. I just wanted to say your name and just talk about, you know, what you do. Ed Buckley, I'm a mutual clerk at, here in Northampton. Uh, I've worked at the fairs for 20 plus years. How'd you get into it? 
Uh, actually, I used to come down and bet quite a bit. And finally, a guy said to me, a mutual clerk said, why don't you come down and get paid if you're going to be here every day? So I tried it and I liked it. I worked here and Marshfield Fair, Great Barrington Fair, and Berkshire Meet at Great Barrington back in the late 70s, early yeah. 80s. It's a lot of fun. You just wanted to tell my viewers what it entails being a permutual clerk. Uh, we have idiots that come up and try to pick the right horse. We won't mention any names. That's what we're talking about. Uh, they pick numbers, give me money, I give them tickets to uh, hopefully they have winners. Hi, Eddie. Uh, it's not bad. It's, it's a fun job. It's interesting. I like the Did you do anything for preparation? Like, did, no, no, no. you just come? And just... just come. And if you're betting, you can do the job. If you're, but you have to be honest because if you screw the customers or you screw the boss, you're dead. You know, I'll have, I'll have customers try to come through the window if I short them for 20 cents. But, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to account for all your money. And, you know, it comes out of your pay, and if it's more than your pay, you're really stuck because then you have to go write a check. You have to check this what does it mean by counting the money? Like they have a certain total that you have from the yeah. window? Yeah, you can just you can call up the total amount off your machine anytime and balance your box. I do it usually do it two or three times a day. Just like, it's a lot of times. Were you have a supervisor combined? No, I, I've done a supervisor for this part of the okay. thing, so I do it for myself. You know, if, if Jeff comes over and gives me, and says, Eddie, you shorted me $20, or, or I gave you 20 or, or, you gave me $20 too much, I can call through my box and I can say, it wasn't my mistake, because my box is right, Jeff. It's always good because the customer's going to trust you. you know, Jeff will throw money in the window, and not even think twice. Of course, his money's always right anyway. Money well, I'm an experienced better, right. and I always bet to the even, almost always to the right. even amount, yeah. which most people do. But you want to, you want to, you never count your change by giving change because you know it's going to be right. Yeah, because you've we, built up trust over the years. And we, you know, there's there's some guys that are just gains in the rear end, and you know, and you have a new mutual minus. director, don't you? Basil French retired two years ago. Yeah, yeah he was here for us. How long have you been doing this? So what's your name? For 55 years. 55. Marilyn years. George. George Pritchett. Yeah, you've been here as long as I've been to the fairs. I remember coming here when the water was that high. Yeah, I remember when the when the program used to be in the accordion folds. Crying <laughs> out loud. Yeah, I don't know. So that you saw or get yeah. The no, tips? George, the tip sheet has a lot of winners. Seven, seven, eight winners every day. <laughs> we do. We have a lot of winners. Oh, I know. You know, I don't have a good following. They've been coming for years. I know. You turned up on television on. Uh, CBS yeah. 60 Minutes yeah, 2 yeah. the other day. We enjoyed it immensely. Yeah, this is being done for closed circuit uh, cable television in Westchester County, New York. In Chappaqua, with the home of Hillary and uh, Bill Clinton. Will the show all the way around, around Connecticut now? We are going to attempt to show it. We, we just did some uh, footage over from the museum. We're going to do some more. We're going to incorporate one of my horses who's running uh, another day or two yeah. from now. And We have a, a lot of people just to come from Connecticut. That's why I used to say they run this footage in Connecticut. They know I'm still here. I have a lot of clients, a lot of customers. Oh. You have a large following. Yeah. Well, at the very least. Hello, if boss. Being so nice, I'm sure we have to buy a card. Yeah. <laughs> How much are those? Uh, two. Two. There you go, George. Thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. Thanks a lot. Good luck. See ya. I imagine you will be at Suffolk Downs. Oh yeah. Well, then uh, my partner Bruce Dobson will have will get a tape for you, and okay. we'll make sure you know Bruce. Yeah, I know. And Bruce. I'm Jeffrey Bruce. Dean. Take a good follow. Now it's five five in the third race. Well, the basic part of how to uh, figure who you're going to bet on in horse racing is looking at the past performances. These are the past performances for the first race of the Three County Fair. They go listed by post position order, then there are the morning line odds, those are the odds that the racing secretary assumes will be the starting point. Then you, you review it through this horse here, the 21st of August of three, he raced in Charlestown in West Virginia, a race of four and a half furlongs. The winner of the race went 22 and a piece for the first quarter, 43 for the half, and closed out 54.9. It was a race for three-year-old and upward uh, fillies and mares, and the claiming price was $2,500. $2,500 is what an owner who has started a horse at the meeting may put in a check or a timestamp 
And if that is the only one, the minute the gates open, the person who did the claiming owns this horse, but the, the previous owner will keep any purse that comes in. And it was a speed, a speed rating of 45 for this horse. And his post positions were uh, from the eight at the seven, he was fifth at the half, ninth at the top of the stretch, and he finished ninth, beaten 12 lengths, and I dead last. The jockey was J.J. Vecchez. He carried 118 pounds, and he had front wraps and uh, Lasix, which is an anti-bleeding medication. He was 20 to one, and these are the horses that ran in front of him. And you analyze all this information, and that's how you determine who you're going to wager on in each individual race. And they have win, which is obvious, and there's place, if the horse bet the horse to place and he wins, you still get paid. Or show, that's third, and if you bet him for third, he comes second or first, you still win. If you bet just to win, he must, of course, win the race. Then there's exotic type betting, which are called uh, exactas, which, as their name implies, you must buy, get them in either, I mean, in exact order. For example, one, two, they, if you bet that way, it must come in that way. They also offer quiniela betting, which means uh, either way. So if you, on a quinella, if you bet uh, $2 on one, two, and it comes in two, one, you still collect. Then they have other exotic bets known as the triple, which is self-explanatory. You must get all three in proper order. Most people uh, box. By boxing these means if you, for a triple, for example, you want the one, two, three, and you do a $2 box, that's 12 Dollars. That's six individual bets which cover any combination of the one, the two, or the three in coming in any order. That's a box and that's a, a win. And that basically is the way the, uh, the wagering system goes. Oh, there's one other event that's called the Daily Double, which is a really an old time bet. It's not as popular as it used to be, but it's picking the winner of the first and the second race. For many, many years before the advent of Quinellas, uh, Exactas, and uh, Triples, the Daily Double was the only so-called exotic betting offered at any race meeting. Now it's a rather minor part of the betting as the other, or the exotics as they're called, have taken over so much more of the public's uh, affinity for get, getting a lot back for a small wager. And that basically is the betting and the form and everything else. How does the wagering at the at the track at the moment of the race affect the odds? And then the track uh, takes of what's called no, a big, it, right? It's not a big. It's very simply, this is called totalizator betting. The house, uh, the, the track operators do not care who wins or loses. Basically, what they're doing is they're taking in the money into a central pool and then they divide it by the number of starters, which gives them the odds. The association, or who's running the meeting, takes out approximately 18 to 20 percent of that which covers the cost of per, per, uh, purses, uh, taxes, etc., one thing and another. And so it, the common denominator is the $2 bet. The tote board, when the race is over and the prices go up, it reflects the figures for what a $2 bet would be. And that's how totalizator betting works. So the, there's no thing uh, uh, regarding to the, the track's concern, who wins or loses, because they make out regardless of what uh, what goes on. So that, that is, this is a convention book covering the different types of races that will be run at the Northampton Fair in their 10 days of racing. And in the condition book, I'll skip to Sunday, these are the type of races that will be run. For example, the first race on Sunday will, is a purse of $6,000 for Massachusetts bred fillies and mares, three-year-olds and up. Three-year-olds have 120 pounds, older 124. Non-winners of two races since July 31st of 2003 are allowed two pounds, a race since then, four pounds. The claiming price is $6,250. <laughs> and the race will be approximately five furlongs. Now, when the owners get the condition books, when they prepare to come to the meeting, they look in the different races that they're going to write for that day, 
and see if they have a horse in their stable that fits this condition. If it does, they enter them. And if the race is called fills, if enough owners enter horses that are eligible for this particular race, then they will assign post positions. They will shake the pills by, which is a lottery to determine the post position of the individual horses. And then that race is, we'll call it, is filled. And then they, they will put it, continue that process nine times for the nine races on the day's card from approximately 14 races which they're writing, but of only which nine will go. And that's the purpose of the condition book and how they determine where the horses are going to You'll note that from the condition book that virtually every race is a claiming race which basically means that if you enter a horse in the race someone else who is eligible to claim that is an owner who has started a horse at the meeting currently running he decides he wants your horse he issues a certified check to the racing secretary for the amount of the claiming price of the race and when the minute the race goes off the gates open he owns that horse, assuming he's the only claimant. And at the end of the race, he, his groom will take the horse to his stable. The previous owner will receive any purse monies that the horse ran for. Now this can be a two-edged sword. God forbid the horse can drop dead on the racetrack and the man that did the claiming owns the horse and has to get rid of it. That, is, that has happened. Now you also have a case where a horse can be very popular at the claiming uh, shed and maybe three or four owners who have, and trainers can, can claim. At that point here at Northampton, they have what they call a shake-off. They'll put four pills in, if there's, assuming there's four claimers, and they'll shake out and the winner... Yeah, yeah this is the claim. I want to show this to you. Thank God. This is the hardest part. Here come the paramedics. I think they're going to try to go out there. This is a unique race. It's a family sport. I said it
Joseph and Call to Boost and are entering the racetrack for the third race of the afternoon over a distance of six and a half furlongs, a field of seven going coastward. Number one, Michael C. carries two pounds over the amended weight, 126. The number seven horse, Nunya Yobinas, ridden by Juan Rojina. And Nunya Yobinas, six pounds over, will pack 124. The eight horse in the race, wide receiver, four pounds over, the amended impost, 122. Post time at about three minutes for the third. Three more to load, Doodle and Luke, Nunya Yobinas, and wide receiver. The rest of the field is in line. Doodle and Duke, or Doodle and Luke, enters the gate, waiting on Nunya Yobinas and wide receiver. One more to load, Nunya Yobinas enters the gate, waiting on wide receiver. Wide receiver moves in, the flag is up, they're in line, it is post time. And they're off, away to a very nice start indeed on the extreme outside, wide receiver, down along the inside, Forrest Frankie, those two duel for the lead, going to the turn the first time, Forrest Frankie on the inside, three parts of a length over, wide receiver. Uh, laying third is Doodle and Luke, uh, half a length over, Michael C. Along the inside, you've got Smokey Way. As they come down the lane the first time, Forrest Frankie has assumed command by a length. On the outside, wide receiver closing the gap as they go to the turn. Third out the middle of the racetrack is Doodle and Loop. Along the inside, Michael C. Saving ground is Smoky Way. Then you come back to Quixote Bill, and Nuno Yobinas can see them all. By the three-eighths pole they go, Forrest Frankie has it three parts of a length. Wide receiver stalking that leader, trying to pick him up midway down the backside. It's Forrest Frankie by a half a length. Wide receiver right there. Gap of two lengths, and you come back to Smoky Way, who is starting to pick up the leaders, going to the turn. Then you come back to Doodle and Loop. Midway through the turn, Forrest Frankie opens it up to a length and a half. Wide receiver right there, second. Smoky Way is third. They come to the 16th pole. Forrest Frankie in front by two over wide receiver. Smoky Way is third. Forrest Frankie wins it. I believe wide receiver was second and Smoky Way was third. Yeah. <sighs> 